fighting in the Hamas-Israel war, I realized the importance of the Israeli intelligence in this land. That's right, you're here today on Insights Israel in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. We discover that going to war is more than just might. Yeah. It's wisdom, it's intelligence, and it's a shrewd wisdom that our intelligence forces have. Definitely. Behind the headlines lies an entire community that lives in the shadows. And today, that's our story. The story of the men and women that make up Israel's intelligence community. We've always needed these type of people. Going all the way back to Joshua and the spies who scout this land, we've always had individuals who operated below the radar. And still to this very day, we rely on the intelligence community of this country to keep us safe, to keep us secure, and to keep us informed. Today we get a very unique peek into their world, the secretive world of the Israeli intelligence community. You know what we say here in the Middle East? There is a diplomacy on the table and beneath the table. Beneath the table is too crowded. A lot of things happen beneath the table and you know nothing about it. All the activities of the Mossad are clandestine operations and one could not speak about it even many years from today. The combination between high technology and courageous people, this is the secret of the Mossad. I'm heading to meet Nina Fatal, a member of Israel's intelligence community. In a world where secrets are closely guarded, talking to Nina is a good way to understand what's hidden beneath the surface. You know, the intelligence service here is built from three main forces. One is the Mossad, the most known in Israel. I think that Mossad and Shalom are the Hebrew words known all over the world. And then the army and the Shabak, the internal security. And I served in both research units, one in the army and the other one in the Mossad. Known for their top-notch effectiveness and innovation, Israel's intelligence agencies are a model for nations worldwide. Delving deeper into their methods, it's no wonder why. If I ask you, if you have any idea, how many pieces of information we receive daily? Do you have an idea? Today? Yes. In the millions, many millions would be my guess. Nine millions each day. Sometimes it's more. It's collecting information and knowing how to collect and to analyze. By the way, we don't call our member from the Mossad all over the world spy. We don't spy. We call them secret warrior. How to build a secret warrior? We take this person and we build another person. So in order to build another person, he has to study where he was at the age of two years old in what kindergarten, what school, friends, the cinema, the coffee shop that they used to go there. It's a complete different person. What remains is the language that he knows and the face. For example, Eli Cohen, he was born in Egypt, mm -hmm. but we have built him as someone that was born in Syria. Eli Cohen was one of the most famous Mossad secret warriors. His mission, penetrating deep into Syria's power circles in the 1960s, dramatically changed the Middle East political landscape specifically during the Six-Day War. You know something about the Six Days War? A few things. In 67, do you know that this war has another name? Three hours in June. Three hours in June and the war was ended. You finish the war in three hours? Why? How? Though executed in Damascus two years prior to the 1967 Six-Day War, the espionage intelligence gathered by Eli Cohen was pivotal in guiding the IDF during a crucial preemptive airstrike, Operation Focus. In three hours on June 5th, Israel strategically targeted the air forces of Egypt, Jordan, and Syria, effectively achieving air superiority. But even that is too straightforward for the Israeli intelligence service. Israel starts the war knowing that it's coming, preemptively destroys the majority of the air forces and the airfields of the Arab countries. But you're saying, hold on, here's the backstory to that story. This is how we fooled the Egyptians yes. because of the intelligence work that we did. And that's right. And you were part of that. Yes. All the Jews from Egypt has to leave Egypt. We thought that between those persons that are leaving Egypt, 
a kind of a spy will come to Israel. And one day, a member, he came to Israel. He said that his name is Jacques Bitton, a Jewish name. They asked him how many languages you know. He said Arabic and a bit of English. And all the Jews in Egypt, the main language was French. They started following him. And he has opened a tourist office in Tel Aviv. He even took a secretary to help him. And, uh, you know, we can be very friendly with a lot of people. And some of us were very friendly with the secretary. They asked her, tell me, people are traveling with you, with this agency? She said, no, but he goes three or four times a year to Europe. I don't know from where the money comes. So they followed him to Italy and they saw him meeting in Rome a member of the Egyptian embassy. He was considered the biggest spy that Egypt has ever had. When he returned to Israel, they took him to the VIP's room, put a gun on the table, and they said, OK, three propositions. Bullet in the head, prison, or you cooperate. He said, I will cooperate. And we told him something very, very good for him. We have to do nothing. We will bring you all the best material that you can ever get. And that's what we have done. From this point on, Israel begins feeding Egypt information through its own spy, but not all of it. We said nothing, nothing about the Air Force. So we have attacked Egypt. Knowledge is power. Now we are going to take a look at our memorial wall. Among the few heroic tales that Nina can share, there are countless more still hidden from us. And for every covert hero we know walking among us, there are many who have silently fallen. If you look at the list, all the people are written the same. Nothing at all, only the name and the day that they've passed away. No rank, no unit. Here we have on the wall two lines from a poem. He said, in secrecy they have done their job. Sometimes we know nothing about their life and sometimes nothing about their death. We would like to say thank you, but we don't know the address. I share this gratitude for the selfless dedication of those warriors who have sacrificed so much for our nation. Welcome back. Mati, the Israeli secret services, there's no doubt that every Israeli who walks on the streets of Jerusalem owes those people a huge debt. Yeah, 100%. I think one of the things that touched me most was the sacrifice element, mm. where it's, it's almost impossible for us to imagine like, we work hard days, but these people work without anyone else knowing what they're doing, mm. not even their closest family members, and they do things... Huge that, price to pay. Huge personal price to pay. They live in constant risk, and if something ever happens to them, no one knows. And yet, when you hear them describe what they do, they do with a passion and with a joy and with almost a disregard to their personal safety because they care so much about this country and people. There's no doubt that this episode is about people who are doing without expecting any reward. Mm. People who do stuff that they cannot put on Facebook or on Instagram. And we, that we belong to the kingdom of God, it's time that we learn to do things for the sake of the kingdom of God. My father once told me that the thing that people will thank you here won't be valid for you in the kingdom of God. That's a good line. Let's continue watching about those amazing people who sacrificed their life for the people of Israel. Nina, a wellspring of remarkable tales from Israeli intelligence, also has an incredible personal story. Born into a Mossad family, her life begins in the heart of an enemy state. We lived in Damascus, in Syria. My father was a member of the Interior Service before the creation of the State of Israel. And on 49, my father has built a factory to sew uniform to the Syrian army. One day, a kind of person arrived in the Middle East the name was Fauzi el Kawukji, the bin Laden of the 30s. Name, yeah. He has created the Liberation Army of Palestine. And my father went to him and he said, listen, I am delivering the uniform to the French army, to the Syrian army. I'm ready also to deliver the uniform to your army. And that's how all the information about where is the base, how many person, what kind of guards, arrived to Israel. On 49, I was three years old and I was with my father in the synagogue in Damascus. And suddenly there was a bomb. And my first memory was my father with his white shirt full of blood, trying to pull people. 13 people died. He shouted before at me, he said, go home. 
because our house was not far from the synagogue. But I didn't. Eventually, the Mossad planned to bring Nina's family to Israel by boat. But in a tragic turn of events, her father was betrayed by one of the local boat operators. It was a sheet, a member, that knew what my father is doing. My father sent his mother, my brother, and my sister. They were nine and 10 years old. He sent them with another six boat to Israel. Other arrived to Israel. This boat, he killed them, threw the body in the sea, and escaped to Morocco. It was a kind of revenge against my, the activity of my father. That's what he has done. He killed the family of a member, of the Zionist member. You know, to live with such a story is very difficult. Anyhow, my parents, they didn't give up. Later on, the Mossad was able to bring us to Israel, and we came to Israel on 53, my only brother and my parents. Despite it all, Nina, like her father, along with more than 700 fallen warriors and countless others living amongst society today, have secretly devoted their life to ensuring Israel's security. You know, I have four kids. And every time that I gave birth, my husband tried to convince me, please, something else, find something else. And everything else was like chewing water. And that's why I'm now 77 years old. And I have decided to come here as a volunteer to continue this work of the Interior Service. The fact is that I, I have a very good memory. I remember name, numbers, events. But you know what? If sometimes I will be God, for 10 minutes, I want to put the button of delete <laughs> on some of the memories. I want to delete a lot of things that I would like to delete. With us today, we have somebody that is very known, a very, very close friend of mine, a brother, I called him a brother, who's an author, a writer, wrote several books, Mr. Amir Tsarfati. Amir is also the president of Behold Israel. Amir, we're talking about the Mossad, the Israeli secret uh, yes. services. Very small organization. We're a small country. But there's no doubt that this organization and the Shabak together saved us from so many situations. Can you tell us a bit what, what you know and what you can tell us on this organization? Yes. I think Israel has one of the most renowned intelligence organizations, the Mossad. And it's interesting that it's not only to go and kill the enemy. Mm. The Mossad was supposed to facilitate the immigration of the Ethiopian Jews. Did mm. you know that? Beautiful. The Mossad was supposed to go and facilitate negotiations with the Sudanese to allow a special area for airplanes to land. So we are using secret services not only to go and thwart problems and kill them before they kill us, which is, by the way, rise and kill those before they kill you. It's always like the motto. But also we use it to fulfill the greater calling of Israel, mm. which is to be the home of the Jewish people. Amir, you're a specialist on the Middle East. There's no doubt that the Middle East has changed in the last 10 years, and it's not the same neighborhood. Yeah. How do you see the Middle East? How do you see the situation in the Middle East? And how do you see it in a parallel to the Word of God? Yes. We have to remember that if in 1948 all of our neighbors wanted to destroy us, all of them, Psalm 83, all of them from Lebanon, from Tyre and Sidon, from Syria, from Lebanon, from Jordan, from Egypt and from Iraq, all of them tried and failed. Things have changed since. In the last 16 years, Israel rose to a level of regional superpower, not only through energy, but also through alliances that we, we managed to do with uh, technology, high-tech, uh, uh, you know, agricultural, uh, uh, financial technology, cyber. All of these things made Israel a solid rock upon which even Arab countries mm. can lean right now. And they, the Arabs run to Israel for services they cannot get anywhere else. We supply gas today to Lebanon via, of course, around, but we supply to, to Jordan and to Egypt. These two countries wanted to destroy us in 1948. And right now, literally the only country in our region that wants to destroy us is Iran. The only country. What they did very in a very smart way, they created proxies all around in Yemen, in Iraq, 
in Syria, in Lebanon, <clears throat> and they're using the Palestinians as their subcontractors. These are things that match perfectly to what the prophet Ezekiel wrote in his 38th chapter. You see, in chapter 36, the prophet talked about how God will bring the Jewish people back to the land. In chapter 37, from the ashes of the Holocaust, he's the one, not anyone else, who will place them in the land of Israel. Chapter 38, we're introduced to a country that is safe, secure, and prosperous. We are one of the most prosperous countries. Our GDP surpassed UK and France. We are in the $55,000 GDP per capita club. And we are getting more than most countries around the world. I can Amen. show you that Israel is going to be there at the end of Ezekiel War. Mm -hmm. I can show you that Israel will be there throughout the Millennial Kingdom. Do you have a message sitting here on the bal balcony overlooking this beautiful, beautiful city? Do you have a message for the world? Yes. The message is very clear. If this city is still here, that means God is still on the throne. That means Amen. that means we're not done yet. If we're still here, mm -hmm. you, both of us come from families that um, had roots uh, of the Holocaust. Holocaust survivors. Our very existence here is a, miracle. is a miracle. More than a miracle. Israel is a miracle. The Bible says we are not given the spirit of fear, but of what? Of power, of love, Amen. and of sound mind. Amen. Now more than ever before, we need to exercise those things. We need to rise above circumstances mm. and remember that we of all people know the end of the story. Amir Tzalfati, behold Israel. Thank you. Thank you, you very, very much for coming. And to you, our friend, I think Amir was very clear. Yes, Israel has an intelligence. Yes, we have the Mossad. Yes, we have the IDF. But more than anything, we have the God of Israel and we have you, people around the world who are watchmen on the wall praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Today I have the privilege to meet a man who has sat in the most important rooms and meetings that have shaped the destiny of Israel. You've been Mr. Security your entire life. You've been inside that room that very few people get to enter, where a handful of people have the discussion where they have all the intelligence, all the information, and you've done that all of my lifetime and also before <laughs> that. And I know you can't disclose all the information. But what can you tell us about what the intelligence community in this country knows about our enemies and how we react to that over time? I think that our uh, intelligence apparatuses know a lot. Few people are better qualified to discuss Israeli intelligence than Danny Atom. Among his many titles, he served as deputy commander of Sayeret Matkal, IDF's elite special forces intelligence unit, rose to the rank of Major General, served in the Israeli parliament, and was a director of the Mossad. Everyone around the world has heard about the Mossad, but I think very few people know what it means to be the head of that organization. The secret of the Mossad mm -hmm. are those who serve in the Mossad. This is the main secret and the main power. The combination between high technology and courageous people that think out of the box, touch areas which are almost beyond imagination. This is the secret of the Mossad. People imagine the Mossad, as you know, as the agents, James Bond, hiding in different countries. What do people not understand about an organization, the type of the Mossad? In many cases, the operations that uh, Mossad executes are in real life more dangerous, beyond any imagination to what we have seen in the movies of James Bond. The people in Israel and elsewhere, they are impressed because of many, many stories concerning the Mossad. Some are true and some are not true, but they do not know really how much they owe to the Mossad. Yatom's unique journey took him from the intensity of war rooms to the rooms of Israel's few successful peace talks. You're willing to sit down in a room with the people you fought against one generation earlier and say, for the sake of peace in this country, we're willing to give back everything we fought for, everything we fought for. And in many of those cases, the people denied the offer. Yeah, but uh, Rabin came to the conclusion that he should do his utmost 
in order to stop the wars and the bloodshed. And that the only way to achieve it is by negotiation. In 1994, Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin signed a historic peace treaty with Jordan, its longtime adversary to the East. I escorted him in each and every of those meetings. He decided to meet King Hussein in Aqaba. And the meeting was wonderful. And due to the fact that uh, it was so secret, the Queen Nur, she was the one that brought us the food. I remember she walked with barefoot. Later on, there were additional secret meetings in Amman, London, when the teams that negotiated came to a halt because they could not crack, they could not solve some of the problems. We sat all night, Rabin and Hussein and the team, they went point by point by point, and they solved it. Personally? Personally. Amazing. When the day started, all of a sudden I realized that there is a peace treaty between Israel and Jordan. Unfortunately, negotiations between Israel and Syria were not as successful. Because of Hafez al-Assad, the father of Bashir al-Assad, there is no peace with Syria. He rejected it. What happened during the last meeting with uh, Hafez al-Assad was the following. We drew such a map that very easily al-Assad could say to his people, we retain back all our territory. And Clinton showed him the map and told him, look, this is an idea. If you say that you accept it, I will persuade Israel to accept it. He looked at the map and he said, will I be able to swim in the Lake of Galilee? Assad. Clinton told him yes, and he said, will it be under the control of the Israelis? Clinton said yes, and Hafez al-Assad said, the meeting is over. What a shame. <laughs> Who knows what, what would have happened if we signed that agreement? With the Jordanians, it's been an incredibly sustainable peace agreement. My conclusion is, and I think that it applies also to the Palestinians, yeah. even though it looks today weird because of the situation. I'm sure that if there is an Israeli leader who is committed to peace, and Palestinian leader who is committed to peace, mm -hmm. there will be peace. Hezbollah is a proxy, the Islamic Jihad is a proxy, the Hamas is a proxy of Iran. Vis-a-vis -vis Iran, we must do our utmost in order to prevent them from achieving military nuclear capability, because then it will be an existential threat to the state of Israel. Iran is the only country that announced formally that it intends to destroy Israel, to eliminate Israel, if they will have the capabilities. Who is going to stop them? We need the United States to continue and support us with technology, with weapon systems, to give us backing in the international arena. Prepare with us the possibility that one day there will be a need to attack Iran. In spite of looming challenges and threats, Danny remains confident in Israel's future. There is place to all of us here. It will be very difficult. It will be very tough. But I'm sure that Israel will continue to exist forever. And we will do our utmost in order that it will be fulfilled. Hello, this is Mati here in Jerusalem with TBN Israel. This is Yair Pinto from TBN Israel here in Jerusalem. TBN Israel is keeping viewers informed with Israel-focused news, culture, and what God is doing in this land. Support TBN Israel today online at tbn.org Israel. Thank you.